Okay, so our next present, uh, our next presenter is Mark Tennant. Um, if you don't know who Mark Tennant is, what bush are you been hiding under, kind of thing? So, Mark, basically, um, many of you know what. Uh, I mean, I've, I've worked with many of you in tennis around the, you know, within clubs or within the U.S. Mark kind of was working on all of these projects with red, orange and green and kids and all these things long before I was. So he's been a major part of the development of uh, most of the ITF's resources, not just on um, Tennis Tens, but also on, um, uh, tell me, remind me the adult thing. I Tennis Express. Tennis Express. So the use of tra uh, transitional equipment across all different age platforms. Um, Probably the most experienced level five tutor in this space, working for the LTA right now, and also at the same time running the biggest coach education company in the UK, and also the biggest operator of um, independent courts and independent clubs. So Mark's company basically provide coaches and management for clubs all around the area. So the Resume just goes on and on and on and on and on and I just get intimidated every time I read it. All right, so hopefully you will um, join me in welcoming Mark. He's going to do an, uh, a red session to follow on and um, he'll be available for the next couple of days. He's unfortunately leaving us on Sunday morning, so if you want to speak to him, grab him quick. <laughs> Over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Not obligatory, but preferably over a beer. <laughs> because we can all talk about being professional, but sometimes we just like to have a beer in the evenings, don't we? Um, making their way round somewhere, I don't know where they are, um, are some of these. All right, good job. Um, take one of these. You can take more than one if you want to. But, uh, it's just a little gift from us. Um, just have a look at it. Um, it's a, a website that we created as like a resource hub for coaches called Tennis 24-7. So you've got a month there to take as much out as you want and it's up to you if you want to sign up and carry on your membership. But you've got a month there on us for you to have a look and see a lot more than I can show you in one hour today. Um, not just around 10 and under tennis, a lot of stuff uh, on adults as well, some things around performance tennis. So just have a look and make of it what you will. It's great to be here. Um, Mike, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. I've lost him now, he's over there. Um, I get to travel all around the world and I'm very fortunate with that. Um, the States has not been, I have to say, not been a big part of my travels. I've been a few times. Um, and it's lovely to be here. I've heard about this place, I've heard from others about this place and it's fabulous and it's great to be here myself. And thank you for uh, finding the time of what I'm sure is a busy schedule to be here. It was really interesting listening to what Kenneth was talking about there because one of the things that struck me is that I think a lot of the time as coaches we like to create a sanitized environment where everything is neat and tidy and everything works perfectly well and all the kids know where they have to go and all the balls go in and everybody is doing everything first time and I think you saw from that that it doesn't work that way. All right, and uh, Kenneth talked about the importance of skills, not technique. I don't think we understand enough about that as coaches, okay? Um, and also the fact that sometimes as kids they just have to find a way. All right, Kenneth mentioned the word resilience. I completely agree with that. We've got to develop through our programs and through the way that we are with our kids physical and mental and tactical and technical resilience. And the problem is we can do what we like with them on the training court but actually the match throws up a load of stuff that quite often catches the kids unexpected. So we have to prepare them in a way that allows them to be able to develop as people and as athletes and as tennis players and not just to be machines. And uh, it's really interesting when you look at a lot of the stuff on social media, how a lot of the videos, I'll relate to this later on, how a lot of the videos are just about a little machine and we're asked to comment on it and, you know, what do you think about this kid's forehand? And the first thing you think is, well, first of all, 
he's not moving. Secondly, you fed the ball straight to him. Thirdly, we can't see where the ball is going. So what do you want me to do? Give him some score like an Olympic judge with artistic impression or something? Because actually you're giving me a, a video that I've got no clue what to feed back on. All right, and this is the problem, is that we have to remember that in the end, at the heart of everything we do is the game. That's what we're there for. And there's a huge difference between teaching technique and teaching or training skills for the game. What I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about the progression from red to orange. It's quite tough to get everything I wanted to say into one hour, so I'm going to just show a couple of little examples, really, and just touch on a few things. And uh, over a beer or so, or coffee, whatever, um, we can talk some more. Um, I just want to take you back some years to the time when computer games first started. Do you remember those early computer games? Things have moved on massively now, but if you remember those early computer games, a lot of them were based around the idea that you have level 1, then level 2, and level 3, and level 4. And what happens is that you start to find little ways to get through level 1 as quickly as possible, because level 1's easy, level 1's boring. Ah, oh, level one again, I have to start at level one, but let me just get through it as quickly as possible. Level two, same. I want to get onto the higher levels. I want to get deeper into the game. I want to get into where the unexpected is happening. I wanted to get into uncharted territory. And the problem is, is that there are a lot of coaches out there, yes, coaches, not just players and parents, but coaches out there, who believe that the red game is just something to get through as quickly as possible until we get onto the proper game. And it's really interesting when you look at retention stats and, and, and when players are coming in to the game and when players are leaving the game. And we always used to traditionally say that one of the key dropout periods would be like 13, 14 years old and you know we're sort of coming up with all these reasons like you know relationships, boyfriends, girlfriends, high school, exams, blah blah blah. But actually, if you look carefully, there's a lot of dropout round about the age when the kids would ordinarily be going from red to orange. Right? Round about the age of seven, eight, nine years old. And I think a big reason for that is the fact that they were happy playing the little game on the little court where they could actually play. And all of a sudden, the coach, because he's got a program, or she, has got a program that says, at red, you're going to be there until seven or eight. And then you're going to move up to orange. And at eight, nine, you're going to move up to green. And at nine, ten, you're going to, and so on and so forth. But the problem is, if we base our programs on ages, we're basing our programs on nothing. Because the age of a child tells you nothing, nothing at all, except how many years they've been on the planet. It doesn't tell you a single other thing. And the problem is, if we base our programs on age, then parents get wind of that. And parents start to hang on that. And then they start to have a go at you and they say, well, wait a minute. My daughter's seven. It's time for her to move up. Yeah, yeah, she hit a forehand over the net three weeks ago. So, yeah, she can play. Three weeks ago, she made a ball in court. She's seven, she's got to move up. We have to be really careful, really careful with that. And computer games and kids are not the same. So we cannot take this computer game level one mentality where we try and fast track our kids through. We can't take that and expect to get success. Because what you're going to do is to leave your kids behind. The game is going to leave them behind, the program is going to leave them behind, and in the end they'll walk off and they'll go and do something else that they can do and enjoy with their friends. And clearly we don't want to be in that position. So what I want to do is just to discuss and just touch on a few little examples of some drills. It's by no means the full list. You can make up as many drills as you like, but it's more the principles of some drills that I would expect kids to be able to do on the red program before we even think about them moving to orange. And let's just leave tennis aside for a second. Let's just think about some other sports. Would you ever move a child from one swimming class to the next, where you knew that they couldn't swim a width, but where the next class required them to swim a length, would you ever do that? Of course you wouldn't. You'd put them in armbands, you'd get them to swim a few, a few uh, whatever you do, a few strokes 
all right? And you gradually extend the distance and gradually you remove the buoyancy aids until they can swim a little bit further, until they can, yeah? Until they can swim a width. But you wouldn't make, us, make them try and swim a length before they can swim a width. Let's think about the high jump, another simple example. Would you put the bar up here knowing that they can't jump it? Of course you wouldn't. You'd put the bar down here, you'd work with them on it, and you'd gradually put the bar up. You may even put it down again, and then you put it up again. But that's nothing to do with age. That's to do with the goal or the target and what the child is able to do. And somehow in tennis we think we're different and somehow we think we can put ages to programs and ages to classes and we can try and put our kids through from one level to another regardless of what they're actually able to do. And I lost count ages ago of the amount of times that I saw orange ball programs in clubs anywhere around the world full of kids who can't play. Full of kids who can't play. This is the orange ball class and all the kids are up here. So why is this the orange ball class if they can't even play on the red court? What logical mind suggests that the idea of moving kids up is right because you're seven or eight, but yeah, I know you can't play? On, on which planet does that ever make sense? But somehow reality leaves us and leaves our parents and then the kids get wind of it as well and we end up with this situation where we've got kids getting left behind by the game. So what I want to do is just to start to look a little bit more at what it means to move the kids up. You can see it in the booklet, I'm not sure which page it's in, it's a bit small. There you go, we've got it here. Can I just take that for a second? You've got the colour version. Mine's the black and white version, but if you have a look there you'll see a few things. There's a few spaces if you want to make some notes. When you move the child from the red court to the orange court, you're basically asking them to play on a court which is 94% bigger in area. Just think about that. You're doubling the size of the court, and in the same time that it took you to say, right, you're going to move from red to orange, the child grew that much. In fact, when they walked onto the orange court, they probably shrank. Okay, physically and mentally, because they were looking this way and it's all nice and close. And now they're looking, and, is there an opponent down there somewhere? Wow, this is big. And I'm lost in this big arena, and here I am, and how small do I feel? So we have to be really careful. It's so easy to say, let's move you up. Congratulations, happy birthday, seven years old, eight years old, whatever. But you can't play. Yeah, but you'll be all right, because we says, you know, we've got to move you up. Okay, so we need, to, we need to put a bit of reality to this. Now, I'm not looking for perfection. These are not tests, absolutely not tests. These are not things to be done with a stopwatch or with a, a tape measure or anything like that. All I'm looking for is kids who can play. And whilst we are, as coaches, very good at getting into the detail of this grip or that wrist or this elbow or this leg or that leg, or, sometimes the kids just have to get the job done. So I'm not looking for perfection, I'm just looking for signs, signs, indications that the child is ready to move on to something a little bit bigger and a little bit faster. Because when we make a court 94% bigger, we are making a lot more space for the opponent to hit to. We are requiring that little child who grew that much in the same time, remember, to take a lot more steps forwards and backwards, as well as left and right. Lots more changes of direction. We've got an opponent who's bigger and stronger, who's using a longer racket, and is able to generate a little bit more racket head speed. So that ball is coming faster. The orange ball doesn't bounce a lot more than the red ball, but it's smaller, it will fly faster. So there's a lot of things there that we have to take into account when we move a child from red to orange. It sounds ever so simple to say it. Let's move you up. There you go, I said it. How easy was that? But this is potential meltdown for the kids if we don't handle that process right. So we're looking for children who can play a dynamic game. We're looking for an all-court game who can play from all zones of the court. We're looking for children who are bossing the ball. How many times do we go on court and we see that the ball is bossing the kids? Those kids are nowhere near being in a position to move up. Remember what I said, does it ever make sense to get a kid who can't swim a width to go and swim the full length of the pool? 
Does it ever make sense to move a child up to a 94% bigger court and say, it's fine, I know you can't play, but don't worry about it because you're seven now. So let's start to identify some criteria which help us to define a little bit more when we think the kids are ready. Now the good news is if they're not ready, we can always move them back down again, but that's tough. That's tough on the kids. That feels like a demotion. That feels like a punishment. So we have to be able to phase this in. We have to be able to phase this in and we start to look at it over a period of time. So I'm just going to show you five very simple things that we can start to do with the kids which are not tests, they're absolutely not tests, but they are just things that I would want to do in my program over a period of time that tell me, yeah, this child is in control. This child is in control of his body. This child is in control of the racket. This child is in control of the ball. And therefore, this child is potentially in control of the point. Because that's the way you're going to win points. That's the way you're going to manage the rally, is by being in control. And if you're not in control of the point, it's because you didn't have control of the ball. And if you didn't have control of the ball, it's because you didn't have control of the racket. And if you didn't have control of the racket, it's because you didn't have control of the body. And where do we spend most of our time as coaches? Mechanics, Facebook, check out this kid. Please add your comments. And I'm thinking, well, what am I looking at? Do you want me to give him a six or a seven or an eight? What am I, some sort of judge? I've got no idea. Can he play the game? Oh, you didn't show me that. So we need kids who are in control of their bodies, who can move left and right, forwards and backwards, play ugly sometimes, just find a way. And that's where the work that Kenneth's done and some of what he was talking about today is so important because kids have to adapt. And it's interesting he said, we're not just talking about kids today, we're talking about the way the game's going to be in 10, 15 years' time. If kids can't adapt, if they can't play ugly, if they can't just be resilient and find a way to get the ball to do what they need it to do, to stay in the rally, then those kids aren't ready for anything. And they're going to get upset and hurt very quickly. So these are really simple. And I'm proud of that. I'm not apologizing. Simplicity sometimes is assumed to be a bad thing. It really isn't. OK, how simple is tennis as a game? And who makes it complicated? We do. Because we can make money out of making it complicated. Let's be honest. All right, but tennis is a very simple game. Simple game made complex by coaches. Let's keep it simple and let's just make sure that the kids are ready when they move up. All right, so do I have some kids? <laughs>